a priest, a nun, and the occult. Yes. This is the uh, bizarre murder of Sister Margaret Ann Paul. Let's get into it. Sister Paul was very young. Uh, she knew from an early age that she wanted to be a nun. Uh, whether she had a calling from God or a higher power or whether it was just in order to serve her fellow man in some way, shape or form, uh, she wanted to be a nun. And yes, that's eventually what she uh, did until the time of her death. Uh, she was, uh, at the time of her death, she was in Toledo, Ohio. Uh, she was part of the Sisters of Mercy and the Sisters of Mercy actually, uh, worked at Mercy Hospital in Toledo, Ohio. I don't know if they actually ran the hospital, but I know that they worked there. And, uh... Yeah, she, uh, people described, uh, Sister Paul as being very good at her job. Uh, she was also, uh, said to be very shy, but she, all the patients loved her. And, uh, but a lot of people said she was good at her job and that she, she could probably do any job in that hospital. That's how dedicated to her job she was. Uh, yes. So, uh, on the day in question, uh, it was a Saturday back in 1980. Uh, one of Sister Paul's jobs uh, when Mass was being said was uh, she actually got the chapel ready for Mass, uh, you know, on the weekends. Uh, I don't know if they had Mass during the week, but on this particular particular day, it was Holy Saturday. And for those of you who are not Catholic, uh, Holy Saturday is one of the holiest days of the year, uh, in it. And it is the day before Easter Sunday. So, uh, Sister Paul woke up that morning, like every other morning she got ready. She said her morning prayers and she went off to do her duties like she did every single day. Uh, so she had, she was seen uh, going to the chapel around 7 a.m. And uh, she started getting the chapel ready. And around 7.20, 7.25 a.m., a hospital security guard uh, was actually just making his daily rounds. And he was, one of his rounds was to go into the chapel. So he walked into the chapel uh, found it empty, which he thought was odd. He knew that Sister Paul should have been here by now, getting things ready. And uh, he walks over to the sacristy door. Now, for those of you who don't know what the sacristy is, it is actually a changing room where the priests actually get ready and get dressed in order to say Mass. So he walked over to the sacristy door and pulled on the door and found it locked. Uh, he pulled on it a couple of more times, uh, couldn't get it open. Uh, he didn't actually knock, but he uh, did try to pull on it and found it locked. So at the time, at that particular time, he uh, figured the priests were getting ready. They didn't want to be disturbed, and uh, he left. 
Well, around five minutes later, another sister walks into the chapel, Sister Madeline. Uh, and uh, she walks in and sees evidence laying on the floor of Sister Paul's, uh, of the uh, uh, the water and the wine and the candles and whatnot, uh, laying all over the chapel floor. And right away, you know, she said the hair on the back of her neck stood up because Sister Paul would not treat these items this way. Uh, so she got very, very nervous. So she immediately walked over to the sacristy door. Uh, but Sister Madeline actually had a key. So she opens the door uh, and she described, she described two detectives at the time that she opened the door and uh, she looked in and the room was dimly lit. I mean, hardly any light at all. And she looked on the floor and her eyes had to adjust because she couldn't really make out what she was seeing. So when her eyes adjusted, she at first thought it was a CPR dummy laying on the floor. Well, uh, she looked a little closer and she saw Sister Margaret Ann Paul lying in a pool of blood, uh, cold and dead. So she immediately takes off a running and earlier that morning she had seen two police officers having breakfast in the hospital cafeteria. So she went and got them and said, uh, there is somebody who is hurt laying in the chapel and we need you, you know. And they also uh, had a code over the intercom called Mr. Swift at the time, back in 1980. And Mr. Swift, uh, for anybody who worked at the hospital, uh, was a code for uh, someone who needed immediate medical attention. So if you were not tied down, uh, you had to come a running and they all came a running. So the police officers get there. Uh, the sister Madeline does, uh, say, yes, this is sister Margaret and Paul. Uh, she is lying in a pool of blood. Now I'm not going to show any po post-mortem photos, but I will show one photo. Uh, it is a reenactment of what happened. And I will just do a close-up shot and you will see it right here. There was something unusual uh, about Sister Paul uh, that was found on her forehead. Uh, she was found to have been anointed with her own blood. Now, what you're looking at is a reenactment. It is not the real Sister Paul. Uh, yes, she was found with uh, her forehead anointed with her own blood. Yeah, so by the time the detectives got there, they found uh, Father Swiatecki. Uh, his name is Father Jerome Swiatecki, and uh, he was found giving Sister Paul her last rites before the detectives even got there. So, uh, and, uh, they found that kind of odd that he had, actually he had said he had come upon her while Sister Madeline was running to get help and the, then he heard the code of Mr. Swift and so he had actually found Sister Paul before everyone else and was giving her her last rites. So, uh, the detectives found this really, really odd. Uh, so, uh, yeah, they, uh, had him, I don't want to say they zeroed in on him as a suspect, but, you know, everybody close to the victim is considered a suspect until they are ruled out. So, like I said, they saw uh, Father Swiatecki giving uh, Sister Paul her last rites, so they immediately bring him in for questioning. Now, Father Jerome Swiatecki was considered a very jovial man, uh, kind of a joker. He was a smoker. Uh, he was also an alcoholic, and he was sent to Mercy Hospital uh, t in the hopes that he would dry out. And, uh, but 
There were some people who said that they loved him, and but most of the nuns at the hospital did not like Father Switecki. And in fact, it came to be known that Sister Paul had had an argument with Father Switecki uh, the Saturday before, the Saturday before that, they act, or the Sunday before, I'm sorry, the Sunday before she died. Uh, they had gotten into an argument, Sister Paul and Father Switecki, over the fact that uh, Father Switecki had cut the mass short. So she gave him an earful. So, uh, yeah, so he did admit that they had an argument about that, uh, but it was nothing. Uh, she just let me know that I had cut the mass short and she was unhappy about it. But he claims to have not killed her. So, uh, he was also described as a very tall man, over 6'1", uh, a very heavy set man, and he was also described as having very meaty hands. So, uh, yeah, if, and Sister Paul was a very tiny woman, so he could have, uh, you know, actually been the killer. You know, he was big enough to overpower her. So, uh, they give him a polygraph test and he, uh, passes the polygraph, you know, uh, with, uh, four gold stars. I mean, he passed the polygraph, so they moved on. Well, they moved on to the other priest who was uh, at the hospital, and that priest's name is Father Gordon Robinson. Now, compared to Father Switecki, Father Robinson was actually described as being only about five foot seven and about 150 pounds. He was a very quiet man, a shy man. A lot of people described him as a loner. Uh, so they brought Father Gordon in for questioning and they are questioning him for several hours. And all of a sudden he kind of interrupts the detectives and says, all right, I'll tell you. I was in the confessional after Sister Paul was murdered and the killer came and confess to her murder. Now, those of you who may be Catholic know that even just him saying that little bit, he is breaking the sanctity of the confessional. Uh, you can go and confess to whatever crime, and it is uh, the sanctity of the confessional. Uh, it is, uh, yeah, he, uh, he said that the killer confessed in the confessional. So, uh, one of the detectives was a staunch Catholic and just by Father Gordon mentioning this, he knew he was breaking the sanctity of the confessional. So he tried to immediately stop the questioning, but the other detectives in the room were peppering, uh, Father Gordon with questions saying, well, you've told us this much now tell it all. Uh, if he confessed to you and you know who did it, you need to tell us. We need to solve this murder. Well, he stood his ground and he would not say another word. And the other detective who was Catholic uh, said, uh, no, he's breaking the sanctity of the confessional. We can't go any farther with this. He cannot tell us. So then they continue to ask Father Gordon more questions and then all of a sudden, he blurts out again, well, uh, guys, I, I lied. Uh, no one came to me in the confessional. I actually made that up. Uh, and they asked him, well, why did you lie? And he said, well, I just wanted this to end. Hmm. Okay. So they asked him if he would take a polygraph. He agreed to take a polygraph, and uh, he failed miserably. It showed deception. So Father Gordon actually raised his hand and said, well, I have a reason for that. Uh, since Sister Paul's death, uh, a doctor has put me on Valium, and that could, contri could contribute to the fact of why I may have failed the polygraph test. Emphasis on May. So, uh... They had to throw out the polygraph because he was 
technically under the influence of Valium. Uh, and uh, they went on their way. Well, uh, actually, Father Gordon left, and uh, but the detective still thought something was odd about this guy. It just it. it they, uh, uh, in my research, uh, the original detectives actually gave a, a, uh, you know, an, an interview and they had said that even though he failed the polygraph and he was technically under the influence and they couldn't use it, you can't use it in a court of law. You cannot use a polygraph here in the United States under a court of law. Uh, but, uh, it helps the, uh, detectives, uh, you know, it helps in the research of their case and to help solve this case. Well, uh, they still thought something was odd about Father Gordon. So before he left, they asked him, uh, would it be all right if we search your quarters? And he said, sure, absolutely. So they actually got a court order with his permission to search his quarters at the hospital. And, uh, they didn't find anything remarkable other than the fact they found a souvenir letter opener and one of the detectives decided to go ahead and bag it and tag it and put it in the evidence box and take it down to the station. So, uh, they did send the, uh, the souvenir letter opener, uh, down to the lab to see if it had any traces of blood on it. And they found no traces of blood on the souvenir letter opener. So basically everything that was taken from Father Gordon's quarters back in 1980 was put into a box, put on a shelf and, uh, forgotten about. But in the meantime, in Toledo, Ohio, they had a serial killer uh, yeah, they did. And, uh, the, the newspapers dubbed him the Sunday morning slasher. Yeah. Catchy name, right? So, uh, he was to have, his MO was to rape and murder women. And, uh, back to, I have to go back a little bit in order for this to make sense. Uh, Sister Paul was found laying, uh, prone with her arms down at her sides, uh, yes, she was anointed with her own blood and, uh, her girdle and her hose were found down to be around her ankles. So, uh, other than the fact of the anointing with her own blood on her forehead, uh, the MO kind of fit. I mean, I think they were trying to put a square peg in a round hole personally, but, uh, they had to investigate this anyway. So, uh, and... So, you know, the, 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 the squad that was investigating Sister Paul's murder, uh, actually started to dwindle down as the months and months went by and eventually, uh, the case went cold. But in the meantime, during 1981, uh, they, te the Texas authorities actually captured a man named Coral Eugene Watt. And he confessed to being the Sunday morning slasher who had been in the area at the same time that Sister Margaret Paul yes, was the murdered. The detectives from Toledo actually go down to Texas and interview uh, Coral Eugene Watts about the mur murder of Sister Paul. Well... He said he may be many things, but he would never, ever murder a nun. Well, uh, they peppered him with more questions. And at the end of their interview, they decided that this is not our guy. He uh, has no, uh, he, he uh, actually confessed to at least 30 to 40 murders. And they even think that he even killed up to 80 women. But, uh, he would, did not know anything about Sister Margaret and Paul. So the detectives left there, uh, saying that this is not our guy. Another nun, uh, her name was not mentioned. Uh, she started having, uh, 
repressed memories come back of being sexually abused when she was a little girl. And she also said that she was forced to watch members of the Catholic faith, including priests and nuns, do animal sacrifices as well as human sacrifices. So after all these memories starting starting to come back years later, she went to the police in Ohio and she told her story. And at the end of that interview, the detectives asked her, uh, do you know the name of any of the priests who abused you? And she said, yes. And she gave them the name of Father Gordon Robinson. Yes, the same Gordon Robinson uh, who was the priest at Mercy Hospital during the time of Sister Paul's murder and who falsely claimed that the killer uh, confessed to him in the confessional. So right away, they get, they open up the, uh, the Sister Paul murder and they go into the evidence locker and dust off all the evidence and find all the evidence that was collected from uh, Father Gordon's quarters. And they actually found the uh, uh, souvenir letter opener. I will actually show you a police uh, picture of that particular uh, souvenir letter opener. So, uh, you know, Sister Paul was actually found with uh, 31 stab wounds as well as the anointing of the blood on her forehead. And uh, she was found to not have been sexually assaulted. Uh, they believe the person who was responsible for this actually po pulled her hose and her girdle down in order to uh, kind of throw detectives off the trail as far as it being a sexual crime as well. Uh, so when the detectives reopened the case, uh, that letter opener, just the original detective who was on the case back in 1980 and who now was on the new cold case, working on this cold case, uh, he decided that he needed to do, he needed to exhume Sister Paul's body, uh, because he needed to know, uh, if the uh, letter opener was the murder weapon. So uh, they actually get permission from Sister Paul's surviving family members and they do agree to uh, exhume her body and they do and they take her to the, uh, to the uh, medical, medical examiner's office and uh, they check her over uh, and... Uh, they take the souvenir letter opener and she was also found with an altar cloth wrapped around her right hand. So the detectives not only took the souvenir letter opener, but they took the altar cloth and uh, down to the medical examiner's uh, office where they were performing uh, another uh, autopsy, if you will, on Sister Paul. So the medical examiner lays the, uh, she has gloves on and she lays the uh, altar cloth out on the table and she notices that there are many, many puncture wounds in the altar cloth. And then she starts looking at the souvenir letter opener and then she kind of turns the altar cloth a couple of different ways and she notices, uh, there are blood stains. There are Sister Paul's blood stains on this altar cloth, and there are blood stains that actually fit the uh, where the souvenir letter opener or the murder weapon was laid on the altar cloth. And then that's not all she found. She also found that the altar altar cloth was laid in such a way uh, that it was placed kind of diagonally and that to her it looked like somebody had put an actual cross on top of the altar 
but they put it upside down. And they stabbed nine times around that cross. And while uh, performing her examination in front of the detectives, they actually could make out an upside down cross on her body, on her torso of, of an upside down cross, which, uh, you know, this deals with the occult, this deals with, uh, you know, uh, experts sort of were interviewed and they weighed in and they said, this is a desecration to the religion itself by taking somebody, taking an innocent and putting an altar cloth over her, essentially making her an altar herself and then murdering her, uh, which is the highest form of sacrifice to the devil himself or to Satan, whichever you want to call him. So uh, armed with this new evidence and because they had gotten the souvenir letter opener, you know, and one, oh, and one, one of the last things they did was they checked to see if the souvenir letter opener actually fit the wounds on Sister Paul's body. And this is a quote from the detectives. They said that letter opener fit into one of the wounds in her neck like a key fits into a lock. So that's all they needed. So armed with that new evidence, they got a brand new warrant to search uh, Father Gordon's uh, new quarters. And when they searched his quarters, they found something pretty interesting. Yeah, they found a book on the occult. And it wasn't just a book that he had uh, just, you know, laying around. It was hidden. And they started thumbing through those pages. Now you have to remember this is in 2001, 2002. Uh, armed, you know, uh, this is DNA has been around for a while. So they start thumbing around through these pages and they found some pages that were highlighted and underlined. And one of those pages uh, said something to the effect of the sacrifice of an innocent on an altar is the highest form of uh, offering uh, to Satan. So uh, they immediately arrest Father Gordon uh, and uh, take him down to the station. Well, now he knows he's been arrested for Sister Paul's murder. This is 20 some years later. Uh, her family actually finds out about this on the news. The detectives did not tell them personally. They had to find out on the news, uh, that they had somebody in custody. They didn't say who it was, but they had somebody in custody. So they, uh, the original detective back in 1980 is interviewing him and he pretty much just shuts down and uh, does not say anything. So after a couple of hours, the detective leaves and says, well, this is going nowhere. So uh, yeah, I'm going. So uh, armed with all the evidence they had, they figured they had, as well as they found his DNA on her body, uh, on the altar cloth. They found his DNA on the altar cloth. And of course they found his DNA on the souvenir letter opener. Uh, so they figured they had enough evidence to go to court. So in 2003, they go to court. Uh, obviously father Gordon pleads not guilty. He said he is innocent. Uh, he did not do it. You have the wrong man. Well, they go to court, trial lasts about 14 days, and in the end, a jury of 12 men and women convict Father Gordon of the murder of Sister Paul and give him life in prison without the possibility of parole. So, uh, Father Gordon didn't just go off to, to prison quietly. He uh, decided to, you know, it was his right to appeal uh, his conviction and he appealed it until the day that he died. So he was in prison for roughly around 15 years. Uh, he ended up having a heart attack, was put in the infirmary, taken to the hospital and he died. And it was said that on the day of his death, he knew he was going to die and he 
still claimed he was an innocent man. All right, everyone. Well, that is the disturbing and bizarre case of the murder of Sister Paul. Uh, it kind of gives me the shivers because I was raised Catholic. I consider myself a Catholic. Uh, I'm not here to preach to you, but it does give me the shivers that there are possibly priests and nuns out there portraying themselves as men and women of God and uh, actually doing the opposite and practicing uh, you know, Satan worship, it, sa Satan worship or devil worship. Uh, it is, uh, unfathomable to me that that could happen. And, uh, so, but at least Sister Paul was served justice. Her case is considered closed. Uh, the DA and the detectives firmly believe that Father Gordon was their man. Oh, and also, I forgot to tell you, you would think that Father Gordon, because of the charges of murder laid against him, he would have been excommunicated from the church. Nope. And he was not stripped of his uh, holy robe, so to speak. He uh, stayed a priest in prison, counseled several, several prisoners, and uh, was a priest until the day that he died. So that's it, everyone. That's it for me. I hope you enjoyed today's video. Uh, remember to like and subscribe. Also remember to hit the post notification bell as well. So you will be notified of all of my videos in the future. I thank you for watching. And remember, they were loved by many, but mourned by all.